What is going on, Sooner Nation? Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Barry and Mac Show. As always, myself, Barry, personal trainer, sports performance coach out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And alongside me, former Sooner wide receiver, 2000 national champ, Mr. Damian Mackey. How are we doing today, D Mac? What's going on, B? Doing well. Uh, locked in for another episode of the BM show and uh, excited to uh, show some love to our girls winning that, that natty. You know what I'm saying? Patty with another natty. You know what I'm saying? That, that, uh, that trophy box is turning into a fatty. Did I just make up a rap? Was that a rap Ooh, right there? Bars. <laughs> Bars. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> now, nah, good stuff. Um, summer's summer's on the way. Some of the freshmen are in. Um, wrapped up our four part series. If you haven't listened to it, there's four direct parts talking about summer and and what you can expect to get out of it. Ready to start talking current team. Who needs to step up? Who's gonna surprise? By the way, we generally do pretty good in these B. So I'm excited to do these yeah. next three or four because we've each year each of us have picked an unknown and seen some of those guys level up. Um, that's rock and roll. Absolutely, man. And speaking of, as we start every show, OU Insider is bringing you this podcast today. Go over to OUinsider.com, grab yourself a membership, and uh, they're dominating just like OU softball. D Mac. Um, go out there. Jada Coleman gets it done. Tiara Jennings, Kelly Maxwell, outstanding player for the series. OU softball, and I want to let you touch on this a little bit, came into this year with a team where some people were looking at them with a little bit of that kind of kind of s- slight gaze of like, is this team going to to have enough to get over the hump and win a national championship again? You know, you guys struggled from the, you know, the 2000 win in the natty, trying to do it again the following year. It's not easy. Continuously winning is very, very difficult. And this was the year, if you were going to be snake bitten, that it probably should have happened. And it didn't. They went out there. We talked pre-show. They went out there and took care of Texas. The, the game wasn't, that they weren't even that entertaining of games in terms of, just the the edge of your seat, what's going to happen. There were moments, right? But it felt like mostly utter domination, like it tends to be when you get Texas on a big stage. Just saying. So, DMAC, touch on some of the things that, that, that you saw from the team this year, maybe what this means to the university as softball continues that dominance. Yeah, I salute to the young ladies, man. They did a great job. They can. Comp- they can boast and and I, I think they should poke their chest out and let everybody know uh, when you do things once, it could be on accident. When you do think twice, people say generally, maybe you got lucky. When you do things three times, you're legit. But when you do it four times, mm. like that's like, that's like, by the way, I don't think it's ever happened in softball history where the same program won four consecutive. So they, right, they set a new precedent there. Uh, We have seniors who have never felt what it feels like to lose their last game of the season. Again, I don't think that's ever been done. So that's setting new precedents there. Um, But, you know, with with winning comes uh, more responsibility. And now you've got, you know, young ladies who come up through the program and there's going to be pressure. There's going to be pressure on them to say, are you going to be the class that ends the run right and so obviously mm. the streak the streak that they had i think they had like a uh i don't know how many game win streak but they had a regular season game win streak where they had like 30 40 or 50 victories in a row then they had like two straight consecutive world series streaks where they had 20 game streak and then they finally got beat this 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 world series and so that streak ended but the one that matters Right, the GOAT conversations. Um, in 2024, everybody wants to talk about all stat, like personal stats and, and, and advanced metrics and blah, blah, blah. Listen, man, when I signed up to play Little League soccer, it was to win. You know what I'm saying? We hey. didn't do participation trophies. When I when I went to high school sports, we weren't talking about who had the, the highest yards per carry or, you know what I'm saying, advanced metrics. We was trying to win the section in the state championship. Those girls come to OU to win, and they've done that again. Um, and I'm proud of them. I, I am going to pat myself on the back. 
what I said going into the uh, the World Series, I said they are very reminiscent of the Chiefs, where if you were going to get the Chiefs, this was last season was the season yeah. to get them. They had some not glaring holes, but they had areas where uh, they could be um, – you're right. They, they weren't bulletproof. They weren't impenetrable. And uh, I think our team went through a part of the season where a lot of other teams may have said to themselves, this is the year to get OU. And that's that pedigree. That is that that experience where, you know, you've got the Jada Coleman's and the Tierra Jennings of the world who they just don't know how to lose the Alus and the Jordy Balls and and those, you know, the Shea Knightons from, you, you know, four or five years ago, yeah. whatever, whatever you're like that, the residue from those players of yesteryear. By the way, that's what the term yesteryear means. Yesteryear is not just the past. Yesteryear is some significance, you know what I'm saying? And so the significance of what those young ladies have been, those battles they've been in, in the yesteryears, I mean, they outclassed Texas. By the third inning, the game was pretty much, you know, uh, it, it was like, oh, I think OU was winning three to one. And then Texas kind of went, I think, four to three for half an inning. And then we went five to three. And then we went eight to four. Um, that's the definition of outclassed. I think Texas being our opponent was bad for Texas. The worst thing Texas, the worst thing Texas could have done is beat us. I wouldn't call it a fluke. It was actually a phenomenal play in the yeah. uh, in season, um, you know, series that they had. They beat us on that throw at the plate to get whoever that the young lady was running uh, to to tie the game, and it was good for them in the moment. Very reminiscent of Kansas City, right? Kansas City's losing some of those games mid year, and all of a sudden, uh, Patrick Mahomes looks like he's not the same guy, and yeah. you know, and, but that pedigree, that experience, it, it it shows itself, and then I think it's supreme coaching. You can't have a conversation yeah. about OU softball and not discuss Pat, discuss Patty. Watch this. I'm gonna ask you a question. Let me see if you and I'm a I'm I'm football player through and through. By the way, I'm Bob yeah. Stoops through and through. I'm a Bob Homer, whatever. Bob taught me yeah. how to win, and damn it, I use it today. Uh, Bear, Bud, Bob, Barry, and Bud, name the best OU coach all times, all sports. It's got to be Patty Gasso at this Doesn't point. Doesn't it man. have to be Cat? I mean, it has to be Patty Gasso. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Salute to Bud. Salute to Barry. Salute to Bob. Salute to 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 all you know gymnastics. You know yeah. they they in there. They in gymnastics the has is in the mix. But man, when you are don't they have different coaches though? Sports, though? They, haven't they, they do? Haven't they, yeah, I think that I think yeah, I don't think they are all by the same. It's coach. different too, and 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 it's a team. Not that gymnastics isn't a team sport, but it's a different dynamic when you're having to bring a unit together like you are with football and basketball and every year you got to reconstruct the team. Yeah, it is. It's it's hard. Let me say one more thing. Patty won by the uh, traditional rules, the eight season, or excuse me, the eight, well, let's say seven of the eight natties started with the rules 10 years ago with no NIL, no transfer portal. Then when I introduced them, she continued to win. Now that it's entrenched, she's still continuing to win that that. I'm a football guy, but gosh, you gotta, you gotta give folks their flowers, especially while they're alive and winning, man. I don't know. Patty might be the goat of OU coaches. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. I mean, man, if she keeps going, she's going to be in the argument for that John Wooden, Nick Saban, Bear Bryant kind of, kind of mold in terms of just pure coaching. How good were you? Man, to to produce what she's produced, to do it over an extended period of time, to do it with such class. They haven't had issues with the team. They've they've been, you know, controversy free. They've produced really good, high character people out of the program. You know, yep. people who, you know, the person I was reading some discussion about who might take over, it's probably gonna end up being a a former player later on or someone who is has been entrenched in the program, somebody who has the OU DNA, right? Uh, Somebody who has that and is able to, to know what the expectations are, know what OU softball is. It was a big part of why you bring a coach like Venables back to Oklahoma, knowing obviously how to win championships and get it done, but also having been there at another 
time, seen multiple eras take place and saw what it took to win at a place like OU, which brings us full circle to what we're talking about today, DMAC. We're going to make this really easy for the viewers to understand. The title is going to be crystal clear. Each of us are going to give our top three players for this season who need to have big summers. We could approach this from any angle. We could approach it from they're low on the depth chart. Maybe they're up on the depth chart. But either way, we see in some way these guys have got to make a showing. They've got to have a, a very dominant summer or a summer in which they are able to change or improve aspects of their game. DMAX, since I told you mine off the record pre-show, I'm going to let you go first, and we'll just ping-pong this thing I back and forth. Yeah. So, oh, so we're going to do one at a time. We're, we're going to do one at a time. We're going to go right. back and forth with it. We'll leave All people right. uh, on the edge of their seats. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first things, uh, I, 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 I am one of those few people who believe offense wins championships in 2024. I'm just saying the hey. game is the game. That's where the money comes. They, it's an offensive game now. They want to let folk win, and, and they want to see the scoreboard uh, go up. There's no way to run an offense uh, and be successful. And right out the gate, I'm kind of cheating, but uh, so what? It's my pod, so damn it, I make the rules. Uh, the offensive line unit. And it's the one position group in football where all five have to be able to work together in order for you to be successful. Um, it, it's kind of low-hanging fruit in the sense that it was the biggest um, concern to the program going into spring. I also think it was a very bright surprise um, as as string as spring as spring culminated and we got to the spring game and we saw that group actually play much better than anticipated we saw yeah. individual players play much better than anticipated you could bring up sexton or taylor you could bring in the transfer at o-line or at the center you could bring in some of the guards that are returning back who were hoping this to, to level up and, and step into leadership roles but i really want to look at them from the context of a unit Right, because a couple of things need to happen in order for the success to happen. Number one, as a unit, that group needs to get stronger. Um, just talking to some of the coaches and um, some of the expectations, not so much weight room strong. There, there are plenty yeah. weight room strong, more so base strength, trunk, ass, moving people, not getting moved into the backfield. This is the time. Summer is the opportunity for those guys to get more explosive through the hips, to get a much stronger base through their Olympic lifts and their, and their cleans and things of that, or excuse me, squats and things of that nature. I believe the unit, uh, very reminiscent of our Natty team, 2000. There was a lot of moving pieces happening, right? Bubba was a backup and his, and a walk on his entire career. Howard Duncan was just coming in. Stock was leaving. Matt O'Neill left. And when, you know, those guys are going to the league, uh, Al Basinger is a guy who was a kind of a, a program also also kind of a guy for for three or four years and coming into the senior year we had a group where when you look at them you see they have potential frank coming over from the defensive side he had only yeah. played four or five games as as an offensive player the year before um and then of course we we know how those guys progressed this group i see a lot of similarities in a sense that there's talent there and those puppies coming in i think are going to solidify epl and, and brooks are two that I think are really going to come in here and, and uh, if nothing else, raise the standard and generate competition. Um, but they can't do that if those guys aren't present and and come with the the, the requisite talent for summer and the group itself, right? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how that impacts the team and especially the offense uh, going into the SEC. But man, you, you're looking at the team and you're talking about what position or player needs to take full advantage of the summer. Um, I don't think we have a chance in the SEC if that group doesn't get stronger, um, doesn't have a level of cohesion, doesn't begin to mesh as five working as one and develop that chemistry. And a lot of that is developed between the months of June, July and the beginning of August. I completely agree. I mean, especially going into the SEC, that is where you are. You're you're going to win or lose the conference. You're going to win or lose games based on how you play on the line of scrimmage. And I'm going to keep that same vein for this individual going over to the other side of the ball, though, 
talking a little defense. He's a guy we look up now, DMAC. He's on year number three. One, two, year three. And I'm talking about PJ Adabare. He came in five star, absolute stud. Is this link. his third season? This will be his third season. No way. Yep. Nah, it's his second. His second? There's no way. RMT. Hold on. RMT. This is RMT. Was well, that's right? Second. So second season. There we go. About to second say, season. Because he'd be a bust yeah. if he was going into season three. He'd be a bust. I'm just saying. So yeah. He okay. Yeah. RMT. And then he came in last year. That's right. Yeah. He came, but he came in during the spring. Okay. Second season. Five star. Well, RMT's also was on the list, but we'll we'll, we'll save that for another day. He's got to make the jump. So when you look at the players who are around him, you've got Caden Woolard, who was brought in as a transfer, who really showed out in the spring game. Ethan Downs is obviously not going to be losing his spot. You do have R. Mason Thomas. You do have Trace Ford. You have guys who are, you know, that they've they've entrenched themselves. And last year, you kept waiting on the on the flash moments. You kept waiting on is is PJ going to have that moment where he shows that athleticism, shows that length, shows that ability to to play like players who Venables has had in the past who have fit that mold. Does he have the ability to to get that done? And I think going into this year, playing in the SEC, you're going to have to have those guys. You're not going to win games that you probably are on the fence winning, right? You go to your LSUs, you have Alabama come to Norman, you're playing Ole Miss. How many times have we watched an LSU-Alabama game and it is typically the team that has the guy dominating on the edge that tends to win that game, right? You can go back in years past with your Will Andersons, LSU has had guys the team with the best edge players who's able to pressure the quarterback typically wins those games and gets it done. So for me, PJ was a player that I absolutely loved coming out of high school. I thought he was, although he needed to strengthen the base a little bit, his balance would get thrown off, which has been the thing that you've seen. He has yeah. struggled with guys who have really strong bases who take away if he can't just absolutely speed by you, his balance and leverage to dig that foot in and bend, I think Caden Woolard does it better right now. I think Caden Woolard is more polished in that regard. He had a dad who was a you know a high level football player, uh, so and that stuff gets passed down. PJ has some of that in his DNA, but so far, it hasn't really. It hasn't flashed, I think, in the way people have expected it to flash. So, and even spring game, go back to that. This past year, I think there was a little bit of disappointment. There, there was some, you know, there were some some moments, but I think for the most part, it's been we're waiting to see him look like a Dan Cody, yep. look like a Jonathan Jackson, look like a guy who is uh, Jimmy Wilkerson, a guy oh, who well. is making – an oboe, right? A guy who is making plays consistently, you know, an Eric Stryker, a guy who just is a terror off the edge. If you don't have that kind of player, it's going to be real hard to win. And I think in order for the Sooners to get it done, as I pass it back over to you, it's going to start on the line of scrimmage with both sides and defensive line has to have studs. Offensive line has to have studs. Who you got next, D-Mac? I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I'd like to see him in a two, uh, stand, in a two, uh, two point sometimes coming off the edge in a, in a sprinter stance. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think, I think there's some, I think there's some, uh, opportunities for him to get, to leverage his get out <clears throat> and, and be able to leverage his upper body. Uh, I'm going to go one level behind him and I'm going to go to the running mate of who I think you're going to say next. Uh, and I, and this, people might say, oh, Mackie, you've been talking about this guy for two years. I have. But I also believe that uh, he is the stabilizer of the defense. He was able to stabilize the consistency of the defense. However, his biggest error or his biggest area of growth was that he was a real light in the ass. But when you watch film, he immediately jumps off the page because he's where he's supposed to be. He is a supreme athlete. And when it's time to tackle, he 
puts people down in their tracks. He is, the, as of right now, he's the Robin to Danny Stutzman. Um, again, he's the kind of kid brother uh, with all the pun involved for kid, but Kip Lewis is a guy who mm. I believe with a very strong summer. Um, generally, when you're in your third year in the program, uh, your grown man strength starts to come. I just, even though my body didn't change much between my sophomore and junior year, my actual strength and ability to just leverage and understand my body did. I was farther away from being a kid and, and more mature and being a man. Um, I don't know that he's going to look 27 pounds heavier. What I hope he does is obviously gain another five to eight pounds of mass to add to his body just over the course of summer, which he can do pretty uh, healthily if he if he's doing things correctly um, but also that strength because his football IQ guys it I gotta tell you Danny for all he is he's a stud Kip does the right thing more consistently than Danny Kip, Kip reminds me of a poor man's Rocky uh, Rocky's a guy who was always in the right fit and Rocky when he tackled you you were going down and, and if he got a fingernail on you he was gonna hold you up for his teammates to come right and so um, Kip played young last year, but he played fierce. He played aggressive. Again, I think he's a guy who a lot of guys on the team, he, he, he's a guy who you can just watch on film. Guys gravitate to him because he's one of those guys that make you feel comfortable, right? When, when Roy Lee's on the field and if the play is going to the, to the weak side B gap, you know, Roy is going to be there. You don't have to guess if he's going to be caught and all kind of, you know, minutia, he's going to be in his position. Kip is a guy who has that kind of an it. And he can go from being a, um, I would say, a week-to-week -week starter, which is what he was last year, to an entrenched veteran, right, who will be the next man up after Danny if he makes the strides he needs to make this year. Because here's the other side of the coin, Barry. Here's the other side of the coin. If he don't, backer is not bare by any stretch of the imagination yeah. between – uh, McCullough and those two pups from last year, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of other options. Danny's entrenched. Danny's not giving up his spot unless he's can't play. If Danny's even uh, halfway able to play, he's earned the right to get the reps. Kip is a week to week starter, as, as I see it right now. And if he doesn't have a plus summer, he, if his weakness, which everyone in America knows, any team that watches film says run right at him, get a guard on him, they'll gobble him up and 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 cut away from where he is and in, in, in his fit. If he can't answer that, he's a guy who you can't have a, be a down in down out player, right? Canik eventually yeah. had to leave the field because he was only helpful blitzing. And teams knew that. And so if, if Kanek wasn't blitzing, if you put him any type of coverage or any type of counteraction, any type of window dressing, right, you'd get him a step or two behind the play and you're out the gate. Uh, Kip doesn't have those problems. No. But if you run right at Kip, you run that power, you run that lead, you've got a guard coming down and kicking him out or leading up through the hole and he can't answer that, he's in trouble. Summertime is going to be a big opportunity for him to gain the girth, gain the weight, um, and, and really just figure out how to get his body to do what he needs to do to win. Kip Lewis for me, number two. Man, I'm going to go other side of the ball. Now I'm going to go offense for this one. And I was kind of juggling it between a, a few different guys, but this one to me, again, we're talking about Ballyhooed guys of the 23 class. And based on what OU has brought in at your position that, that you played at your alma mater, I want to talk about Jacquez Petaway a little bit. Very ballyhooed in that sort of Mario Williams, uh, high-level guy. Um, looked great in high school. We talked pre-show. Good Love route runner. Really good speed. We said he's a guy who can be a vertical threat. He's a guy who could be a uh, possession going across the middle. There was a lot of things that he could do. You can give him the ball behind the line of scrimmage and let him run, which it seemed OU has tried to – at times do a few of those things, but you got Dion Burks. Now you have Nick Anderson. You've got Andrell Anthony. Who's coming back. Who I think we, we talked about this last year when he went down greatly impacted the offense. He is that kind of player and guys now 
They come back from ACL surgeries. It's not an Achilles. He's going to come back ready to go. He's going to come back just as good, if not better, than he was previously. I wouldn't even be surprised if maybe there's aspects of his game that are maybe a little more polished just because of the time off. But you've also got guys coming in behind him, Zion Reagans, players who are in that same vein, maybe a little bit faster, and as I'm going to talk about, maybe a little bit smoother in the open field. And this was something that that fans caught on to, and I've heard you comment on it, but he was a little bit uh, mechanical and predictable with some of his, his movement in the open field. Um, that There is a level of comfort. You know, if you talk about Antonio Perkins being on one end of the spectrum in terms of comfort and playing in space, playing with guys, veering all around you, I would put Jacquez Petaway in what he looked like at the other end of that spectrum in terms of not having that comfort with the ball in his hands, not being able to, to feel space, feel distance, right? You could put, you know, the, the jukes on guys all you want. You could try and put that foot in the ground. If you don't have that feel of timing, if you don't have the feel of where the formation is putting you, where you are when you catch the ball, which shoulder you need to turn over if you're trying to make that next move. One of the guys who I thought made a massive jump in that regard from his freshman to sophomore year might be the biggest jump I've ever seen in terms of guys at OU was C.D. Lamb. I thought C.D. from freshman year to sophomore year came back a different player in terms of once he got the ball in his hands. Yes, he got stronger. We saw him. Yeah, but but he also did technical things. He started playing lower. If you want to beat guys in, in an agility game, you got to be able to get low. You got to be able to drop your hips because you have to have a very aggressive exit angle for the for where you're going. If you don't have that, if you're playing with those really high shins, playing really tall, you might have some, you know, you might get some some grass on the corner which he had the, uh, what was it, the kickoff return that ended up getting called back where they oh, run that yeah. little reverse, which was cool. It was cute. But <laughs> for OU to be what they need to be, players like him who were those ballyhooed guys, man, they, they've got to also continue to step up. And he's a guy who I think has the potential to do it. Will he do it? And that's where summer for him, impactful in terms of getting out there, doing some of the seven on seven that you talked about towards the end, building some of that confidence against some of these guys trying to, to get his body more agile, improve the change of direction, improve the strength, improve his, his perception, his visual acuity so that when he is on the field, he's filling those things a lot more naturally. And that's where that leap is going to come in terms of being a guy who, fringe getting snaps, you know, three, four plays when the game's out of hand to being a guy who's getting meaningful possessions in the, in the heat of fire. Um, to, to your point, seven, seven on seven is going to be important for him. I mm. think he's a guy because he's a track guy. I think he's a guy who will make his times. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have any uh, inside info on that stuff, but I just, hope and think track guys generally can figure it out yeah but 707 if it's anything like it was when we played like those reps are gold and those reps are ego i think that more than gold mm -hmm. it ain't your turn yet pup you know what i'm saying like it was yeah. very clear like you gotta earn that around here we don't just give those away if the number one cue is up sit your ass down and get a mental rep when the threes go, you go. Now the very, um, the very you know, precious thing you want to make sure you don't do is curb a guy who's ready. If a guy's ready, okay. and and the quarterbacks generally do a good job of that, the quarterbacks will police because there are sometimes. I was the fresher, fresher freshman, and I was like, bro, I had a really good spring. I ended the spring game as a one. I had on a red jersey, right? Like the ones were red in the red white game. They were like, nah, Mackie, you know. And I ain't gonna say no names, JT, but you know, some of those guys who, <laughs> <laughs> some of those guys who were ahead of me in seniority, yeah. and I, I just had to tell them like, nah, bro, I'm a one. I'm, I'm, I'm up. Hype, what's up? 
I'm not going until Mackie goes up. Caught co- co- my cue at my back. I-, I got to get those reps. So, but that's that period, right? Because if you punk mm. out, they'll let you punk out. And, and Petaway's wow. a guy, you're right. He just didn't look explosive with the ball like he did in high school. The yeah. the the concern is he didn't. The beautiful thing is freshmen sometimes don't. And sophomore year, they come back and are comfortable with the game and boom, they're a different player. So I really like that one. Uh, I'm going to go with an ease, the easiest one. This is my third one, right? Yeah, this is my third one. I'm going to go with the easiest out of the bunch. I think this is the most important position on the field. I think we have a player that has the highest ceiling we've seen since, since Bake. And Mm. um, ah, yeah, he's not a Kyler. He's a Bake. I think he's, I think he's a Bake. A little bit more athleticism, a little more probably straight ahead speed than Bake had. Uh, but guys, there's a lot of pressure on Jackson, and, and uh, that could be really good, or it could be concerning. The good thing is we've recruited well. We went and got a a a backup and and Thompson's kid, who we know if if there's a game or two, we won't be in that position we were in against Texas two years ago. And then we went and got a freshman stud, Baby Hawk who turned some heads in the spring. But Jackson Arnold, I want to speak specifically to him. There's two things that I'm really uh, concerned about and or excited about for him as it go as we go into the summer and what, what he has available to him. Number one, as a Q, he's got to earn a respect of those guys in the workouts. Again, I, I told the story of hype and we did those eight trippers and a lot of guys fell off. Hype did not quit. He, 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 he looked like poor thing. He looked like Bambi. His legs was jello and, and, and he could barely move, but he did not quit. And, and we never forgot that. And so I'm looking forward to seeing Jackson be a guy. And again, I think he's a guy coming from the program. He comes from being entrenched in our program in a full season and a half. Now, I think he'll be okay. Um, so that part matters, but the other part that matters is he needs to become the floor general. He needs to be the guy calling the plays he needs to be the guy who sees um when they go from man to zone when they go from base to cloud when they're going from uh, a big cover five to a robber coming in the hole um jumping jumping the in cuts he's got to see that stuff and 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 start to know uh tendencies our guys don't change their stuff it got to a point where you know we knew the defense the second time around going against our defense two full years and he's going into a second interval. We knew what Brown meant. We knew what blue meant. We knew what right. Six pack meant. There were, there were a lot, and not even just the terminology. We knew the roles, responsibilities, hype knew it. We knew it. Jackson's a guy who's got to be able to read our defense if we expect him to read other defenses. But here's the other thing I want to see him do. Um, and he was a pup last year and he did some of that in games, but I think in the, in the Arizona game, it was something that was a little concerning. He's got to make the plays that are there. When the play's there, yeah. one, he's got to recognize it. Two, he's got to hit the mark. Uh, if Jackson does those two things, he's got enough talent uh, uh, within to be a, a Heisman contender. He really does. Um, if he doesn't, in the day and age of the game we play now, it there could just be some uh, there could just be some opportunities. This is a what have you done for me lately game. The kids are paid, so they're, they're treated more like pros than they are like like scholastic, you know, student athletes. Um, and he's a kid, definitely not a PJ. PJ was underwhelming and needs to show better this year. Jackson throughout the season had games. I'm I'm thinking about the Tulsa game where he came in and threw some nice balls down the field yep. and hit and hit uh hit Anderson a couple of times. I'm thinking about BYU where he gritted it out and made some big time plays. Even in the Arizona game, we win that game where Farouk doesn't fumble. Um, totally killed our momentum. We're going to go up three scores in the third yep. quarter, and, and they're ready to quit. They're literally ready to give up. We fumble that ball and we give them life. Um, that's not his fault, um, but he's still got to make another step. Kids got to grow up fast. He's going into probably a three X in terms of increase in competition, size, skill, speed. Yeah. Uh, and, and the SEC used to be three yards in a cloud of dust. Now they're running complex offense, complex defense. Everybody runs a little something different. It was, they used to mimic each other a ton in the early two thousands, a lot of 43, you know, with some either man or cover two people are mixing it up, doing their kind of, you know, they've got these coaches who are coming in using analytics and, and things of that nature. Kids got to be smart. He's got to be a guy who, again, can be the floor general. Um, But, man, I want to see him when the play is there. He's got to recognize it, and he's got to hit the mark. 
I think I think for for OU, that's the most important piece for for this season. For this season to be successful, and I, I talked about it on another podcast, he's got to level his game up. And I, we talked about that Arizona game, man. If you really go back and watch, he went from had he thrown another touchdown pass on that drive, you're talking about him possibly being the MVP of oh. the game. To now they the momentum shifts, they end up losing. Yeah, he had he had a couple picks, or I want to say three picks, right? It, it, or was it two picks and then they had the fumbles? Two picks and, and two picks. Trouble. And one of one of them was the the one to Drake Stoops, uh just a that's kind of a freshman ball. The other one was a player who just made an outstanding play. Awesome play. Yep. And you can't really, you know, that's something that that most even seniors and guys who are our experience will will get. Um, hammer with that stuff we saw Landry Jones do that all the time so anyways I'm <laughs> moving over to the other side of the ball only saying that because we had a lot of Landry Jones love <laughs> right. on the last show <laughs> there was a lot of Landry love so just shout out Landry Jones man Landry we'd love to have you on the podcast that would be fantastic it'd be good stuff well nice. we'll see yeah that'd be good stuff but I'm going back over to the defensive side of the ball you talked about floor general, you talked about being a leader, getting the respect of your teammates. And this is a guy who I don't think he's fighting for that. He has that. He's a guy who has made jumps. He's talked about it himself. This man now has iconic moments that are etched in Sooner lore forever, right? He became essentially immortal with a pregame speech before – OU goes out there and dominates Texas. I'm talking about Danny Stutzman. And not in a sense of he needs to have a big summer physically. He needs to have a big summer from a you know, speed standpoint, learning the game. Obviously, there are areas where he can improve. There are areas where he made tremendous strides last year. The game's going to continue to slow down for him. He's trying to get to that next level. He is trying to be a player to play in the NFL. But... To go down as a Sooner, great. Demek, you talked about it in the last episode. The the Torrance Marshall, Rocky Kalmus thing that 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 happened um, o- over the off season. Stutzman's got to have some of that. He's got to go into this year not just saying I'm going to be a a major role player and I'm going to be a leader on the defense. No, he has to go into this saying. I'm going to be the best defensive player in college football. That is who I am. This defense is going to be a top unit in the country. He is a guy, OU hasn't had guys come back for their final send-off year, at least at his level, in a long time, right? So to, to make the jump, that OU needs to make defensively, I think it is going to start with Stutzman. It is going to start with him being the player that he can be, right? Not not having even having even fewer moments than some of the lapses a year ago, right? Some of the games where uh, stuff just got – he'd make a play here. He'd have a UCF kind of comes to mind as a game where he played well, but there were enough lags in the game where it was just a little too close for comfort – and there were other factors, but for me, Stutzman has to hold guys accountable. He has to to be the leader and the the true voice in the locker room when you don't really have a guy on the offensive side of the ball, maybe quite yet, who yeah. has that voice. I think Jackson will develop that voice, and he doesn't seem like a guy who's afraid to, to kind of hoist that uh, above his head and, and be that type of player. But if OU wants to go win a national championship, he's got to turn into a Ben Bulware. He's got to be a Torrance Marshall. He's got to be a Will Anderson who, who comes back for Alabama. He's got to be a guy who says, I am the best player on the field. If you are going to beat us, you are going to beat me. And I think for OU, they go as far as Stutzman leads the defense. They go as far as how much he has bought in through the full year. 
And I also think it's a little bit of a fork in the road too in terms of if Stutzman goes out there and he has a dominant season and OU is a high-level defense first year in the SEC, I think you're talking about OU making a run. I think you're talking about a team that's now going to be able to go out. They've already been in every living room since Venables has gotten there just because he carried that cachet. But if OU goes out there and they play dominant defense first year in the SEC, they're not Texas A&M. They're not Missouri. They're not, they're not new money like Clemson. OU has that pedigree where if they have the right season and things tick their way, OU has the potential for an Alabama-level run in them. They are the kind of program that can do it. I think this is the kind of year where does it go the way of eh, a little disappointing, don't win eight or nine games, or, eight or nine. do they surprise some people and go win the conference? And now you're talking about going into every five stars living room and you got a serious argument for OU being the team that they should pick. Um, any thoughts on that? With all due respect to this season if we win this season we ain't in Alabama echelon yet we don't count our chickens before they hatch Alabama went on a run now it's like five and nine years or something like that and, and yeah. that's longevity um but championship pedigree and caliber and 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 expectations hell yeah I always you know it always irks my soul that from 01 to 08 we didn't win another ship with probably yeah. the best program over the course of those seven years if you look at those seven years, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, you know, between, I mean, you got two Heisman winners, you got AD, you got a ton of NFL guys on defense, um, along with all those receivers and, you know, Q and AD and the rest of the crew, we should have at least won one. And LSU immediately comes to mind and really Florida, Florida, Florida is a game. We should have been able to close the loop on an eight year cycle of two to three ships and saying that was an Oklahoma dynasty uh, didn't happen. And so I just, I just know the work it takes to get multiple ships. We got one and thought we were going to get a few and it never happened. So I don't want to put that much pressure on the team yeah. right now. I want to focus on um, dominating preseason, identify our quarterback, and, and and setting us up for success and then going into conference play with other teams knowing choose my friends but you can't fuck with us this year like that that's the mentality i want to have so park that stutzman is a guy who has a lot of uh substance to him um he does have that um flair and by the way he has flair in his personality and he has flair in his ability to make plays yeah i like stud since his freshman year before he messed yeah. his arm up he was out there flying around playing ball. Um, this year for me, to add to what everything you said about Stutz, I just want him to become more of a student of the game. Um, there are, again, this is a critique, and this is just from a football eye of X's and O's. There are still some pretty basic uh, fits that he'll miss. And um, I believe, we're just watching film sometimes, he's trying to make a play. Because there are other times where he will instinctively do something and it'll make the flash play, right? It, it's, the, it's the West Virginia game. It's the, right, you know, some of these games, uh, Nebraska a few years yeah. ago, you know, he, he'll he he'll make the big play. Um, so I think he's trying to make plays and I don't want to ever take that out of a player. When a player has that ability and they're able to hit the mark sometimes, uh, by all means, it, right, that's the for proverbial Mike Stoops and Roy, 2001, don't leave your feet. And then, of course, the Superman plays happens because he leaves his feet again, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine if he was a Simon, you know, uh, Teddy, Oof. Teddy's Teddy, Teddy's to the T. Okay, coach, I'm going to do exactly as you tell it. Roy is like, instincts tell me jump. And, of course, the second time he jumps and Teddy gets the tug. But Studs is, I think that's, I think that's a great pick. It's kind of synonymous with what I'm talking about with regard to Jackson on the other side. The difference is, Stutz does have some experience in that role. He was asked to do that last year. He stepped to the plate and, and was very much so responsible for some of the resurgence in our, in our season. Um, and I think at that position, being the quarterback of the defense, uh, it merits that expectation, especially for, uh, I mean, he's basically a three-year starter. Yeah. Like, 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 you know, uh, BV's first year, Stutz was, Stutz was one of the guys getting 60, 70 snaps a game. So, Ton of reps, 
he needs to make it happen. Those are the guys you lean on when you go into a tougher conference, a higher echelon, much more higher expectations. I think it's a phenomenal pick. Um, I guess I'll say this though, Barry. Uh, those of you guys listening to the pod, go in the comments and said whose list is going to be more hey. impactful to the season. Let's see. Uh, let's, let's see. Go. But we got some. We got some. We got some regulars, man. I don't. I didn't. I didn't. You know. You got you. You can see the comments and see who the folks are. But uh, salute yeah. to some of you guys. A lot of engagement. I'd be yeah. interested to see um, whose list you think is better and who would you guys add. Who's an individual you guys feel is someone that we may not have brought up? There were other names that we were um, considering. Uh, as you can see, uh, Barry was thinking of RMT. Um, I'm a yeah. safety guy. I think I think Billy's a guy who's really important. That we both brought up Dominic. Dominic's a guy who we the program brought him in and has invested in him as such, so that he can be a disruptor, a game wrecker, right? Yeah. And so uh, there are some other guys that that we considered. Uh, he asked me if I brought up Sachuk. Then. That I didn't this yeah. time. I think it's going to be running back by committee. So I'll be interested yeah. to hear who some of you guys' picks are. Uh, I'll be interested to hear who you guys think three is going to be more impactful. And uh, um, also just want to say, <sighs> I think the assistant coaches, Barry, uh, and this is kind of just off the cuff here. This is kind of impromptu. Um, okay. I think we've got some championship level coaches. And then I think we've got some uh, 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 another nucleus or community. I guess I'll say community because you can't assign a number. I don't want people trying to read between the lines and guesstimate who I'm speaking to here. Okay. But I think there's another community of coaches who have a put up or shut up um, expectation this year, That's meaning whether it's recruiting, there are some inconsistencies and they got to get better in that regard, or it's on the field play and their position group hasn't cut the mustard or it's um, development. Right. I think there's a community of coaches. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. Yep. Where yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you just got to you, you, the expectation is you've got to bring it. And so we talk about players. Um, we need to also mention the coaches these players are depending on to get them to their necks. And, and, and these guys are being recruited against by other coaches relative to their position group. Right. Um, I, I want to see uh, certain position groups play to their caliber. I want to see certain um, four and five star recruits who are brought in to be game changers, be put in a position and, and execute at a level uh, where they can deliver uh, in the ways we see fit. All four and five stars are not going to be studs. Sometimes three and two stars are going to be the guys, but um, three years in, I mean, there's some pure home runs. Wide right receiver, home run. Home, home run. run. Home um, run. I think Beatembo has a community who loves him and a community who hates him. I say, Everybody, yeah, he's a good 75 25. Yeah, I think. yeah, I'd say 70 30. Um, yeah. He has skins, though. Dude yeah. is putting first rounders in the league every That's year. Big. Holla back. Holla yeah. back. You know what I'm saying? Uh, DB is a position where once we got that old. Uh, Hollywood fly by night buddy to go with link. And, and now we got a real DB coach in there. Valai, Valai and those guys are, 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 are rocking and rolling. B Hall is a guy again, it's going to be interesting. B Hall again, he had a, he had an all American safety last year, but we want to see that group emerge and be difference makers. Um, Backer, right. We, we had a, we had a coaching change at backer. Um, and, and so that was one where I think it was a put up or shut up. And I think we went ahead and, yep. and, and went a different direction. And then, and then we've got a, a couple other groups where, uh, group or groups <laughs> where, right. We're, we're going to be seeing, you know, um, how those guys deliver on Saturdays. Yeah. And so the coaching piece is important because I tell you what to be. The, the level of coaching in the SEC is just a different level. The Big yeah. 12 has, 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 uh, they are, uh, undervalued. I would agree with that. K State, yeah. K State, top tier coaching, like straight up. Yeah. Baylor fell back a little bit, but Baylor had a very big year last year, the, the prior football season and, and being a cusp of the, the, the playoff type team. Um, Don't so, uh we'll see he he he, he around there might be uh he might i don't know he look like he's a little tired 
By the way, we'll, we'll see. Do do we even care? Like, are we even gonna pay attention to Big Twelve really. anymore? I mean, Arizona State. Are you kidding me, bro? Uh, you know, Utah's gonna come and and big boy a lot of these boys and let them boys know. You, them Utah boys and Kansas are gonna be a problem for everybody <laughs> a, in that conference. Does, this look, year. for real. So I just say that I, the coaching piece. I, I want to make sure yeah. we continue to put pressure on coaches. Coaches are paid a lot of money to deliver at OU. We expect to deliver at a certain caliber. I want to see some coaches uh, earn their paychecks. Yeah, the, I, I think that, and I won't belabor the point, but I, I think so often we either say player or coach, coach or player. It, it's important to remember that if a player is not bought in, yes, sometimes it is the player. You no, just yeah. have – a, a player who's just not the guy for your program. But when you have, I won't say multiple, but it seems like there is a, a consistency of guys not being either bought in or not seeing that development. And, and it's kind of head scratching of like, man, I thought this guy was supposed to be a dude. Why is he not making those steps from a technical aspect, right? Where do you put your hands? Where's your leverage? How do you get it really football ish things when, when you don't, and also just the mental side of, are you, are you as a coach owning that it is your job to build the buy-in in those players? That is a part. If, if you guys haven't read it, this goes for, this is businesses. This is anybody in leadership. This is athletes. Go read Conscious Coaching and, and the volumes by Brett Bartholomew. It's one of the best books you'll ever read. And one of the things it does is, one, it talks about communication. To be a good coach, you got to be able to communicate effectively to all of the different people, not just one kind of group that you kind of kind of hang around with and they're the group that you buddy up with and those are the guys who improve. you got to be able to communicate with everyone. But you also have to be willing to to own it. And one of the things that they talk about in there is if your message is not being picked up, if your message is not being absorbed by the person who you are giving it to, we leave very little chance that it's their fault. It is it is your fault as the communicator like that. that you have not gotten there yet. And then, and if you, sometimes it is that guy, right? But if you take that approach at all times, it means you are going to do your dead level best to try and maximize that person that you are reaching out to. You're not going to give up on them too fast because you have this philosophy that, well, man, if they just don't got it, they just don't got it, right? How many players did you see at OU when you were there who, um, or even even after, right? Where first, second year, they didn't really have it. Then all of a sudden, third, fourth, fifth year, they have that light bulb go off. Maybe they had a coach say something in their ear. I think Stutzman is a great example of a guy whose buy-in changed because of who was communicating the message. That's a good call. So, awesome stuff. Transition Speaking of- Rich to BV, good call. Yeah, huge. And speaking of communicating messages, if you want to message us, we're over there on OUinsider.com. Go to OU. That was pretty good. Go to OUinsider.com. Grab yourself a membership. Brandon, Parker, and the gang over there bringing you all of OU recruiting news. The softball coverage. I'll toot their horn. The softball coverage on OU Insider was top notch. Second to none this year. Podcasts. Bunch of content on the board. If you guys are not members, seriously, go do it. We love being a part of the site. Love being affiliated with them. They've been nothing but amazing to us. DMAC, closing thoughts as we get out of here today, man. Hey, man, dog days of July are going to be on us, but we know July brings August. August brings football. Um, it's coming. I'm all excited. I, what is it? July one is our official birthday in the yeah. SEC. Is that right? They're doing yep. a, they're doing an official thing on the first of July. Cool beans. Um, yeah, man. Super grateful. Uh, keep keep. We're gonna keep blowing this thing out. Uh, I want to do. Uh, uh, just say this on the air, man. So we can kind of start a conversation about it. Top ten offensive players, Bob Stoops era. Top ten defensive hey. players, Bob Stoops era. 
and and you know let's see i, I want to i want to bring up some some names uh out the woodworks uh that, i think that'll be fun and i think we should do like uh top 10 underappreciated sooners you know what I'm saying? And and yeah. really get into some of the guys who may not have been, I, though, I'm going to use your word, ballyhooed. I don't even know how to spell that word, but I know, I know what it means. I know exactly how do you what it spell means. ballyhooed? It's got a Y in there somewhere. L L Y H O O D H O E D. Ballyhooed. E D. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it'll be fun to get some of these That's listicles a out. Stupid word. <laughs> and, uh, a stupid you know. And, and get and, and then I'm excited to get into July and start doing position groups. Yeah. Let's start breaking down those position groups yeah. and what to expect and who's going to be potential starters, who's going to be dark horses, so on and so forth. Uh, just getting back in the saddle, getting back accustomed to it, making sure we, you know, we deliver like we say we're gonna. Oh, and and, and then inviting some of the guys in. Uh, I got I got to get on the horn. I've got five or six guys who say they want to jump on the pod, so we'll get some of these guys in and, and hear from them as well. Absolutely. Hey, if you guys want to hear anybody on this podcast, tag them on uh, tag them on Twitter or X. Go over there. Uh, let them know you want them on the show. Hey, go, go tag Landry. I don't even know if he's on social media. Go tag Landry. We'll get Landry. I'm gonna try to reach show. out to him, bro. I'm gonna try to reach out to him. Let's go. Let's go. The, yeah. the people apparently want it. They want Landry. <laughs> well, we'll. Hey, man. If they're former Sooners, you know that. Let's let's go. Let's make it happen. Make sure to go follow us Instagram. At Dame That Dudes, where you'll find Damien. I'm at B Wise Fitness at letter B W I S E Fitness on X. It's at DMAC13, and you'll find me, same thing, at B Wise Fitness, letter B W I S E Fitness. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. We will see you soon.